and we are live. Welcome everyone to today's episode of The Parlor with my co-host, Matthew Line. And we are going to be covering chapter 42 of Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and we'll be covering that for our first stream, and then after a uh, 15 to 30 minute break, we'll be covering chapter 44. Chapter 42 is Redemption, and 44 Welcome is The Stillest Hour. Episode of the Parlor. After that, we will have, we'll be more than halfway through the book, and... We are more than halfway through the book. We will have finished uh, parts one and two, and then we will have a very long review stream where we'll provide a retrospective on the whole thing and discuss what we've learned and also lay the groundwork for part three. Now, if everyone is ready, and I see we have four people here, if you really love me, you'll press the like button. And let's get started. You'll find the link to what we're reading here in the chat. The link to chapter 42 is in the chat. Chapter 42. Redemption. When Zarathustra went one day over the great bridge, then did the cripples and beggars surround him, and a hunchback spoke thus unto him. Behold, Zarathustra, even the people learn from thee and acquire faith in thy teaching. But for them to, fully be to believe fully in thee, one thing is still needful. Thou must first of all convince us cripples. Here hast thou now a fine selection, and verily an opportunity with more than one forelock. The blind canst thou heal and make the lame run, and from him who hath too much behind, couldst thou well also take away a little. That, I think, would be the right method to make the cripples believe in Zarathustra. So what we have here is a very obvious biblical imagery, but more importantly, what Nietzsche is doing here is he's having Zarathustra speak with precisely the sorts of people that Nietzsche has a problem with. And please keep in mind, these are not physically disabled people. This is a metaphor. What Nietzsche is saying here and what uh, where, he, where he's taking this is all of the people who have basically given into slave morality or are the kind of people who would be flies in the marketplace or tarantulas to use metaphors from other parts of the book. Uh, Matt, what do you take from it? Uh, partially that, certainly, especially the, 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 the ones for whom Nietzsche has shown overt contempt. But then I'm also thinking that there's the element of them or of, of Nietzsche realizing that you have to, well, first to contextualize for those that are just tuning in for the first time, if you happen to be tuning in for the first time, we're understanding Nietzsche's philosophy as being based on this idea that uh, God is dead. Uh, basically modernity killed God, modernity showed that there is no God, and therefore the only thing that you can do in life is to make your own meaning. And the way that you do that is by constantly trying to surpass yourself, taking the loads and the burdens of life, going and attacking them, reducing them down to nothing, and then once you've kind of cleared the way for yourself, once you've gone and, and defeated the things that get in your way, then seeing the world through the eyes of a child growing and producing and making new things and being as great as you possibly can be attempting to turn yourself into what he terms the superman so the question is okay what about the people that don't have as much to offer what about the lame what about the crippled what about the people that can't do that for some legitimate reason what do you say to somebody that can't, or at least that feels that he can't, 
make strides in that direction because he's been dealt an unfair hand or a bad hand from the very beginning. At least that is predominantly how I see Nietzsche setting this up. Because ultimately, he can't go and say, okay, you need to go and try to become the Superman if you can't ultimately uh, set that up as a universal law for everybody. So clearly there needs to be some explanation that suffices so that Nietzsche can with, you know, Nietzsche can go and suggest that everybody go and become the Superman and still remain internally consistent within his paradigm. Am I making any sense at all? You are making perfect sense. And this actually takes it a lot further than the flies and tarantulas and uh and and I think that's a great way to contextualize the rest of this chapter. So I'm gonna continue reading and we'll keep uh talking about it in light of what you said. All right. Zarathustra, however, answered thus unto him who so spoke. When one taketh his hump from the hunchback, then doth one take from him his spirit, so do the people teach. And when one giveth the blind man eyes, then doth he see too many bad things on the earth, so that he curseth him who healed him. And when one giveth the blind man eyes, oh, whoops, <laughs> he, however, who maketh the lame man run, inflicteth upon him the greatest injury, for hardly can he run when his vices run away with him. So do the people teach concerning cripples. And why should not Zarathustra also learn from the people when the people learn from Zarathustra? So he may or may not end with that perspective, but what, what, what Nietzsche sets up there is a supposing perspective that sometimes when you hand something to a person who doesn't have it, it just screws them up. Uh, one example is sort of people, uh, poor people who win the lottery. What happens to that money? Poof, gone. And, and likely they're wind up being in a worse situation because they go and get used to spending habits that wind up entrenching them in debt. Right. But then the question is ultimately, I mean, that 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 in a sense forces Nietzsche to clarify his position. Because what exactly is Nietzsche attempting to do by convincing people to go and uh, pick themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak? What what exactly does is is this entire message of his like? How how is it actually relevant to the cripple, to the blind, uh, to the slow of mind, etc.? Like, there needs to be some sort of an underlying principle pulling it all together, and that's kind of what Nietzsche tries to get at, or actually very clearly gets at, toward the end of this chapter. But I'm not going to spoil it. It is, however, the smallest thing unto me. The smallest thing unto me. Since things. I've been amongst men. What were you saying, Caleb? There are two things here that I was going to say, mm. branching off of that point. You could say that these people, these cripples, should uncrip themselves, and Nietzsche might hand them the means of uncripping themselves. And if they do that, then maybe they won't screw it up. Or he's going to tell them, okay, I'll uncripple you, and you're going to screw it up, but I want you to pick yourself up after that again anyway. Or what if you don't get uncrippled at all? then what can you still do? So, let's see what he has to say. You can continue reading if you like. I was just saying, it's, it's however the smallest thing unto me, since I've been amongst men, to see one person lacking an eye, another an ear, a third a leg, and that others have lost the tongue, or the nose, or the head. Of course, losing the head doesn't mean being decapitated, but just meaning kind of being slow up here, right? So, seeing deformed people especially in the days before modern medicine and vaccinations and so on, that kind of thing was pretty normal. You wind up having uh, people in really bad situations begging for alms and so on. 
people that have legitimately been dealt a very, very bad hand. And Nietzsche says, well, that doesn't really phase him. Or rather, it doesn't phase Zarathustra. And, and of course, because we're talking about Zarathustra as Nietzsche's ego, it doesn't really phase Nietzsche. But does that mean that he's not compassionate? What does that mean? It just means that he's not phased by it. So why, Caleb, would he not be phased by it? Well, because there must also be such people, and as long as they're here, they need a place. And that doesn't necessarily preclude them from being able to have a self-actualized full life, according to his paradigm. Clearly, it wouldn't. F the only reason it wouldn't phase him is if it so doesn't throw a monkey wrench into his view of what people should be doing. Right. And this, incidentally, is why I think that uh, gassing epileptics would not have been high on Nietzsche's list, he himself suffering from poor health. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the idea that uh, the Nazis got what they got from Nietzsche is, is a... It just didn't. It didn't happen that way. Either that, or they completely misunderstood it. I mean, it could be a possibility, but ah, I you 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 can't go from Nietzsche to Nazism. You, th th there is no logical. You have to do a lot of violence to Nietzsche's philosophy. His sister had to edit his work to make it look anti-Semitic. And even then, she wasn't smart enough to figure out what it was that she he was actually getting at. So even if you look at it, 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 it you don't. You can't make the connection from A to B. You can't make the connection the only, from Nietzsche to anti-Semitism. The only reason that the Nazis fell back on Nietzsche was because he was German and he talked about power. And I, I, I think maybe the only member of – the high-ranking member of the Nazi party, not rank-and-file party members like Heidegger was a rank-and-file Nazi party member who did understand Nietzsche very well. But in terms of the high command, I think that Goebbels uh, – would have been the only one who may have understood Nietzsche. He was probably the only one smart enough to do so. Well, Hitler himself may have understood Nietzsche, but I don't think that he just cared at all. Right. He wasn't a Nietzschean. No. No, and I, I don't know if I don't know if any of the Nazis were. I mean, you I guess you might have some of them being incidentally Nietzschean, but still somehow being feeling like they're stuck in a particular paradigm, but then how in the world are you Nietzsche if you're stuck? You know, you wind up right. running, into all, running into all sorts of contradictions. But that's actually kind of irrelevant to the scope of what it is that we're talking about right here. You know, it's just... I've, I see and have seen worse things and diverse things, so hideous... That it should neither like to, to speak of all matters nor even keep silent about some of them. Namely, men who like everything except that they have too much of one thing. Men who are nothing more than a big eye or a big mouth or a big belly or something else big. Reversed yeah. cripples, I call such men. People who are so focused and specialized on one thing. I believe there's some point in this chapter where he talks about a midget with a giant ear. Mm -hmm. And when I came out of my solitude, and when I came out of my solitude and for the first time passed over this bridge, then I could not trust mine eyes, but looked again and again and said at last, That is an ear. An ear as big as a man. I looked still more attentively, and actually there did move under the ear something that was pitiably small and poor and slim. And in truth, this immense ear was perched on a small, thin stalk. The stalk, however, was a man. A person putting a glass to his eyes could even recognize further a small, envious countenance, and also that a bloated soullet dangled at the stalk. The people told me, however, that the big ear was not only a man, but a great man, a genius. <coughs> but I never believed in the people when they spoke of great men, and I hold to my belief that it was a reversed cripple who had too little of everything and too much of one thing. So what would the giant ear be? A, a, a person with a giant ear does nothing but listen, does nothing but hear, just captures everything that is said, and is extremely envious. What sort of person is that? Well, someone who can't synthesize anything for himself. 
if you, the, what the only reason you have to be envious of somebody else is because they have something that you don't. So, and, and the only way to legitimately get something, it, I mean, I guess we can even get rid of legitimately. The only way to get something is to either make it, have it just be in existence and pluck it up or take it from somebody else. So, if all you're doing is hearing and hearing and hearing, you know, it's it's almost like the kind of a person, I know this would technically be eyes, but it's almost like the kind of a person that does nothing but read self-help books and doesn't actually help himself. Right. Someone, and, and I've met such people, people who are like a walking dictionary of quotations, which is fine. I'm one of those people. You know, I, I, I've got pretty much a Nietzsche quote in my head for every occasion, but I also disagree with him heavily on certain points. And, it's, and you know, these people will make sort of overtures of critical thinking or try to look like they think critically, but really they're incapable of criticizing or synthesizing anything without some, without some kind of intellectual micromanagement. And when they criticize one thinker, they're usually just giving you the criticisms they got from another thinker about the first one. Yes, and if they're loudmouthed about it, then you can say somebody with a big ear and a big mouth and a small brain. Right. Uh, big mouth, small brain, or perhaps large memory. Large memory, the giant ear, hears everything, internalizes everything, but it doesn't get mixed around in there unless somebody sticks their finger in the ear and mixes it around for them. <laughs> So he still hasn't explained what it was he was talking about, but Zarathustra went and took the idea of a cripple, and he expanded it. It's like, okay, so if you're lacking something, what happens if you have more of something? So more or less, he still hasn't gone and made any kind of uh, judgment on the matter. He's just going and taking all these possibilities all these possibilities. He's, okay, you bring me a cripple? Well, what about a reverse cripple? What about somebody with bigger, more extensive, better faculties? What do we say about them? Let's just go and consider all these possibilities and see if there's a way of putting one big umbrella, one idea that kind of encompasses the whole thing. Right. And that's going to be a project that I suspect the rest of this chapter uh, will be will be pursuing. Mm -hmm. Now let's see here. Well, yes, uh, David Sanderson has a point here. Jordan Peterson recommends that you learn how to write. Writing is actually a kind of thinking in itself. Well, it forces you to articulate something precisely. It forces you to articulate something in the best possible way. And I've seen some of these uh, dwarves with giant ears who do write, but it's just regurgitation. Yes. And, and the way that you can tell the person with a giant ear who can write from the person with a giant ear or just a normal-sized ear and a functioning brain or or kind of one that, one, one that can engage in original thought or that can engage in synthesis of some sort is that if... And nowadays, it's almost if you can go and read something on Twitter and it's coming out of somebody's mouth, or if you can go read something on Salon, or you could go and read something on, um, uh, I don't even know, maybe The Atlantic, or, or, or just The New York Times even, or Fox News, or whatever. If, if, if you could hear whatever it is that you're hearing... almost verbatim from another source with no nuance whatsoever and no capacity of giving anything other than the standard arguments for or against such a position, then you realize that you're dealing more with an ideologue or more with somebody that's not thinking for himself and just regurgitating the points as opposed to somebody that can give a nuanced 
response to whatever it might be that somebody brings up as an objection or a nuanced perspective to, okay, how is it that you deal with this very situation here? You know, people, they, they might even feel very secure in their own knowledge. They might, the, the person with the big ear might actually think that he knows something because he doesn't see the difference between him spouting what he spouts and somebody who actually synthesizes things spouting what they spout because it's all spoutings and he can go and actually understand the words of all of them. But the way that we can tell by looking as an outsider, as a third person into this situation is the, is the one that can synthesize, is the one that maybe not necessarily can give an immediate response, but the person that can give an apt response. That's the person that's actually gone and done the legwork. That's the person that's actually gone and done the brain work. That's the person that's actually gone and internalized an idea and made it his own or not. You know, that has come to a conscientious decision to accept parts of things, to reject parts of things, and to, you know, have a more complex, rich, nuanced view of the world. When Zarathustra had thus, had spoken thus unto the hunchback, and unto those of whom the hunchback was the mouthpiece and advocate, then did he turn to his disciples in profound dejection and said, Verily, my friends, I walk amongst men as amongst the fragments and limbs of human beings. This is the terrible thing to mine eye, that I find man broken up and scattered about as on a battle and butcher ground. Uh, battle and butcher ground. I don't know if it was written like that in the original. Oh, oh, oh yes. I don't know if it was like that in the original, but the German word for battle is schlacht, which is, uh, schlachten means slaughter. So battleground and butcher ground are, in German are kind of like this. Um, one moment. In the chat. Yes, I can tell you're trying to learn Norwegian during during a stream. <laughs> yes, I am. So well, multitasking is next to godliness. Yeah. Exactly. But anyway, so um, so so the, so the basic idea is that Nietzsche is uh, remarking. I I still wouldn't say uh, making any kind of a. a I wouldn't say it would be a complaint, but it is a, he's, he's now finally taking a, a judgment and saying, okay, what I really hate is when somebody isn't put together. And he's like, I, it doesn't matter if you're losing something, but if you are broken up, if, you, if there are bits of you here and bits of you there and bits of you everywhere else, then you aren't coherent, you aren't cohesive. You're perhaps double-minded about something. Like, you can't make up your mind. You're thinking, okay, well, here's this perspective and here's that perspective, and you haven't taken the time to knit it all together and to figure out what's actually going on. And there, as if you're in multiple pieces, you can't go anywhere and you can't do anything. You are stuck until you manage to put yourself together. Either that or you're completely dead. You're just so spread out over everything that you're... There's literally nothing left of you. Or maybe something so traumatic happened to you that you are no longer capable of... <coughs> of doing anything. And when mine eye fleeth from the present to the bygone, it findeth ever the same, fragments and limbs and fearful chances, but no men. The present and bygone upon earth, ah, my friends, that is my most unbearable trouble. And I should not know how to live if I were not a seer of what is to come. A seer 
a purposer, a creator, a future itself, and a bridge to the future. And alas, also as it were, a cripple on this bridge. All that is Zarathustra. To reiterate the point from the, I believe it's the first chapter. Um, Are you talking about the metamorphosis to the to the metamorphosis to the camel to the the tightrope walker? Mm. Because man is a rope stretched between the brute and the Superman over an abyss. For Nietzsche, an abyss is something within yourself that you have to see through and dissolve by you know sort of the power of your gaze and. Uh, you know, understanding it until it becomes intelligible to you and is no longer an abyss. So the abyss is in man, or is man. Man is the bridge between the brute and the superman. The brute was man, the superman will be man. This is all man in various stages, and this is also the process of his transformation. Nietzsche has this all packed up in this one really beautiful structure. That doesn't mean it's true, but it is an absolutely wonderful... Uh, absolutely wonderful picture <laughs> well ultimately you need to have something like that if you're going to have any meaning whatsoever in a world with no god whether it be one of self-transcendence or something else you still need to have something to strive for that happens to be the end not necessarily we can't guarantee that it'll actually ever take place but that happens to be the end of humanity according to Nietzsche and I mean of course the end not as in like the world is coming to an end and everything goes up in flames but this this constant striving for improvement and ultimately you know maybe the moral fiber of, of humanity will improve or something takes place that will ultimately replace religion and the meaning and the what it brought to people all basically up until the enlightenment and it started to dissolve as enlightenment philosophy permeated all over the place once again that's right. Nietzsche's perspective not my own and his idea is that man has been fragmented throughout his whole existence, and without this context to hold him together, man must pull himself together. Exactly. So I think that he would, or at least it, it makes it would make sense for him to argue for the existence of some sort of a human nature, but that it might be kind of variable amongst mankind in terms of how far we all have developed toward the Superman and how far both uh, personal evolution, or, you know, like genetic evolution and cultural evolution have taken us. <coughs> and ye also ask yourselves often, who is Zarathustra to us? What shall he be called by us? And like me, did ye give yourselves questions for answers? Is he a promiser, or a fulfiller, or a conqueror, or an inheritor, a harvest, or a plowshare, a physician, or a healed one? Is he a poet, or a genuine one, an emancipator, or a subjugator, a good one, or an evil one? I walk amongst men as the fragments of the future, that future which I contemplate, and it is all my poetization and aspiration to compose and collect into unity what is fragment and riddle and fearful chance. And how could I endure to be a man if man were not also the composer and riddle reader and redeemer of chance? To redeem what is past and to transform every it was into thus would I have it, that only do I call redemption. Okay. There. That. It. There. Right there. Right there. Beginning with, and it is all my poetis poetization. I can't even talk. Poetization ending with that only do I call redemption. Therein he foreshadows his solution to the situation. His one binding one overarching umbrella. 
It's like, okay, what transforms it was to thus would I have it? What in the world does that sound like? What gets us to the point of being the Superman, according to Nietzsche? The will to power. I'm the composer. I'm the riddle reader. I'm the redeemer of chance. Who cares how the dice... Uh, what, what happens when you throw the dice? I am going to make this happen. And that is the will to power. Will. So is the emancipator and joy bringer called. Thus have I taught you, my friends. But now learn this likewise. The will itself is still a prisoner. So what we're struggling with, according to Nietzsche, isn't the hand that we're dealt, but we are struggling to master our own will. It doesn't matter if you're born with uh, two arms and one leg. It doesn't matter if you have a big ear or a small ear or no ear or a big brain or a small brain or a nose or you can't smell. All those other things are secondary on a completely different order of magnitude then is the point of, okay, what do I do with my will? I have my will. Now I need to cultivate it, and I need to shape it, and I need to make my will something that wills for the right thing and drives me regardless of what my circumstances are. That is what Nietzsche uses to tie all of this together. And even if people can't do this self-constituting, self-rolling wheel thing, at least not to the extent that Nietzsche would like, the fact remains that um, if there's anything for a particular kind of person, maybe it doesn't apply to everyone, but if there's anything that is going to pull you out of a slump in your life, it's for some of us, it's this way of thinking, this sort of directedness, this sort of will to power it matters it's not how straight the gate how charged with punishment the scroll i am the master of my fate i am the con i am the captain of my soul is it not i am the captain of my fate i am the master of my soul I, yeah i think it's the other way around master fate captain soul hmm. i think so Uh, Jacob Froelich asks a question. What would you guys say is the strongest rebuttal to Anne's worldview since the time of his writing, if any, particularly concerning the will to power and the pursuit of the Superman? Well, to start off with, um, I want to say a lot of the critiques you're going to find are shit, and I want to steer you away from them. Don't bother with Bertrand Russell's critique. It's <laughs> just him basically being angry at the Nazis. That That's Bertrand Russell's critique of Nietzsche is him talking about Nazis, which I can't blame him for because he was an English person writing during or shortly after World War II, and he spent half a decade watching people he knew and loved being eaten alive by the German war machine, and the Nazis were talking about Nietzsche a lot, so we can forgive Russell for that. Uh, you know, he was normally a really patient, reasonable man, but not in that case. Very, very patient, very reasonable, but not in that case. Um, you also want to stay away from, uh, I believe, it, uh, Santayana is his name? I think it's Santayana, uh, the Spanish guy. He, he talks about Nietzsche a little bit, but it's mostly ad homs again. Um, if you want a decent rebuttal to Nietzsche and building on it, this guy is kind of out of left field, and reading him on a university campus may attract the thought police, but uh, Julius Evola here with Ride the Tiger – makes sort of a criticism um i won't i won't get into it now but basically his criticism which i think is the best fundamental criticism of nietzsche that i've seen is simply that the creation of a new kind of man the superman the new society etc cetera, etc cetera, the scientifically trained intellect that creates values out of its own will blah 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 is a transcendent goal, and nietzsche's philosophy relies on total eminence and it just doesn't work and you can make that bunny path longer and harder to follow but in the final analysis it just won't work 
um, you know, Nietzsche can say, well, we can reach that point, but then, well, is it in transcendent or imminent, Nietzsche? Yeah, how, how in the world do you do actually, you how does the imminent develop into the transcendent? Ultimately, well, you're left with can't. answering that question. If you cannot answer that question, which you can't, and even then, if it could, it still wouldn't work because then it wouldn't be transcendent anymore. Well, so what did you just do? Well, I mean, you just you can't even say even if you could because you can't because imminent and transcendent are two different things. Ultimately, if we are to transcend our very nature, that would involve something from outside of us being able to do it if it happens at all. And so ultimately, you wind up catching Nietzsche in this well at, at, at the I, I hate phrasing it this way but in the self-contradiction and it's not the kind of paradox that you can resolve by jumping levels it's a kind of paradox that just stops everything dead because you got it wrong it's, it's an absurdity, not just a contradiction, an absurdity. And the reason I would, I would venture to say, I can't be 100% sure, but the reason that Nietzsche goes for this idea is ultimately because he is an atheist, but he cannot fathom life going on without purpose. And there's this... Um, a newer book entitled The Atheist's Way, Living Well Without the Gods. And it's an entire book that's kind of a watered-down, weakened version of Nietzsche taken to a fifth-grade level and brought into the late 20th, early 21st century, which basically says that you need to drag meaning out of your ass. It's the, it, it's, it's, it's the, the written by the last man. Yes, exactly. And we know how that winds up working based upon our stream yesterday, but... Right. So ultimately, the answer to the question is that you can't use the imminent to achieve what ultimately is a transcendent goal. Either there is the transcendent, or there isn't. And if all you're left with is the imminent, your only choice, after all of the options have been explored into their end point, is abject nihilism. And that, I would venture to say, scared Nietzsche. And so he defended his philosophy because his existence, his very self in a way, was wrapped up in it. And there was no way he could let go of it without, without actually succumbing to the abyss himself. Right. Willing emancipateth, but what is it that, but what is that called, which still putteth the emancipator in chains? It was. Thus is the will's teeth gnatching, and lonesome tribulation called. Impotent towards what hath been done, it is a malicious spectator of all that is past. Not backward can the will will, that it cannot break time in time's desire, that is the will's lonesome tribulation. Willing emancipateth, what doth willing itself devise in order to get free from its tribulation and mock at its prison? Ah, a fool becometh every prisoner, foolishly delivereth itself also the imprisoned will. That time doth not run backward, that is its animosity, that which was so is the stone which it cannot roll called. And thus doth it roll stones out of animosity and ill humor, and taketh revenge on whatever doth not. Like it, feel rage and ill humor. Thus did the will, the emancipator, become a torturer.
and on all that is capable of suffering it taketh revenge, because it cannot go backward. This, yea, this alone is revenge itself, the will's antipathy to time, and to its it was. Verily, a great folly dwelleth in our will, and it became a curse unto all humanity, that this folly acquired spirit. The spirit of revenge, my friends, that hath hitherto been man's best contemplation, and where there was suffering, it was claimed there was always penalty. And this is interesting here, especially, because this is Nietzsche taking what I what I deduce is quite possibly the only, well, maybe not the only, one of the very few things he likes about Christian ethics, which is actually forgiveness. Just let go of it. The will cannot will backwards, so the will must no longer will to will backwards. When the will does no, not any longer want to will backwards, when it does not will to will backwards, it is emancipated from revenge, and that emancipates the will itself. The will is emancipated when it can emancipate. The, it is emancipated from the past when it emancipates the past from itself. Uh, letting go is freedom. It's it's sort of a, there's a Buddhist metaphor here. Uh, a hot coal. The Buddha called holding onto anger like gripping onto a hot coal because you're gonna throw it at somebody. Well, in the meantime, what's happening to your fucking hand? <laughs> exactly. Bad idea. And so, even if you have every right in the world to be angry about the hand you're dealt, even if you have every right in the world to be resentful of everyone and everything. Even if you're completely justified in that regard, it isn't going to do you any good. It just isn't. The only thing you ever can do is what you can do now. Two seconds ago is still two seconds ago. And that's actually, and if you don't mind me taking a little, an, a, another short hop on the bunny trail, that's one Go of ahead, the regions man. that, that one of the reasons I like virtue ethics so much because there's it's it's always there's always a good thing to do. There's always a good thing to do, no matter how rotten the situation is. And doing the good thing doesn't always guarantee a good result. You can have crappy luck throughout an entire life. And with almost 8 billion people in the world, there are a handful of people that no matter what they decide, they're going to wind up being screwed. But over the course of a lifetime, behaving virtuously is worth it. You know, it's, it's like the psychopath that always lies to everybody. He can go and climb up the ranks of some corporation very quickly until he you realize that he's burnt all of his bridges and then he has to go jump ship and go someplace else and climb up really quickly and so he winds up ultimately not being able to do anything sustainable because he's not behaving in a virtuous way. Similarly, you might wind up having somebody toiling and doing the hard thing, the hard thing over and over again, but doing it because because it's the right thing to do. Not getting a break, not getting a break, not getting a break, not getting a break, not getting a break. And then one day, when the break does come, simply on account of being virtuous and taking the right course of action, they will take the right course of action when opportunity is in their lap and then they'll be able to make the most of it that they wouldn't have been able to do had they not gone and developed themselves to being more virtuous. I'm not making any promises to results, but I am saying that living a virtuous life is the best thing you can do. And Nietzsche would agree, except his virtues are different than mine. Nietzsche, being a philologist and thus being very, very in touch with uh, ancient conceptions of morality and virtue. And, you know, the <coughs> deontology and consequentialism that have dominated Western thinking since the Enlightenment are starting to break apart. It wasn't until the mid-20th century, I believe, when virtue ethics began to be taken seriously again. 
and that was another crack in the great wall of uh of modern thinking, the fact that virtue ethics is now being taken seriously, which it should have been, because in my view, it's the only sensible way to do ethics. But, but that also relies on the existence of a transcendent. Good. Some, something that is inherently good, in and of itself, regardless of any kind of consequences. Virtue ethics are transcendental. Right, right. And I mean, I guess you could make an argument that this sort of Kantian deontology is closer to a virtue ethics than uh, than consequentialism in as much as Kant has this his categorical imperative and yeah. so on. But even, but remember that Kant's epistemology strictly forbids that from being transcendental in any way. And and the problem of grappling exactly. with with, with uh, you know. Or does it? I, I mean, uh, Kant is balanced on a knife edge, and that's a whole can of worms that maybe we shouldn't get into. But, but, but still, I would, I, I would still say that when you take things to their, to their conclusions, deontology still doesn't hold a candle to virtue ethics. It doesn't. And that's because this this sort of uh, the goodwill, the right action, ultimately breaks down to what's appropriate in the circumstances. And I think that saying that something that is representative of what the good man does, the virtuous man, is it, it's going to cash out a lot better. And more to the point, virtue a uh, virtue ethics, if you take it as the ethical part of your philosophy and go ahead and let it interact with everything else in your philosophy, you end up with better stuff all around. For example, a virtue ethical approach to, to epistemology, and there is an ethics of epistemology, mind you, will will result in saying that an epistemology is good partially one of the conditions is insofar as it tends to lead to true beliefs. A doy? And when you um, abstract epistemology, it doesn't do that anymore. Would you mind, Caleb, giving us a little bit of a rundown, just in case people are new to the stream or what have you, of the difference in between consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics? The 10,000-foot yeah. uh, con- perspective? 10,000-foot perspective. Consequentialism takes into account the greater good. People like Bentham. Uh, Marx, in fact, is a consequentialist. Uh, John Stuart Mill, propounders of classical liberalism. Locke probably is a consequentialist. Uh, I haven't read Locke. I, I've read a lot about Locke's secondary sources. I haven't read like uh, his any of his treatises. But consequentialism basically is the idea that the consequences of an action are where the action gets its moral value. What's right and what's wrong depends on the consequences. What will happen if I do this? Which in some ways is a very reasonable way to look at morality. The ends justify the means. Right. You know, in in some ways very reasonable. Well, this chimpanzee deserves to drive a car. No! So, yeah, in in that case, maybe uh, maybe a good idea. So what about deontology? deontology? Deontology is... It's sort of contained within the act itself, and consequentialists can get all mixed up here when they look at deontology because you can look at – and this has happened to me because I considered myself primarily a consequentialist for a long time. But if you look at a particular act and go, oh, well, it's a good act because it leads to good consequences, well, it's not really deontology. It's the goodwill in deontology. I, intentions matter more in deontology. Um, you know, Kant's deontology, well, what if everyone did this? Would it would it lead to a good society? And that sounds like consequentialism, but it's so abstracted and idealized and kind of dogmatic that it ends up being more of a deontology because it's more like I'm not going to do this because I would not have everyone else do this. I will not con- allow my – I will not constrain myself by any law that I would not bind everyone else by, and I will not constrain everyone else by a law that I would not be bound by. That's more of a deontology. Deontology is more, you know, um, I'm going to throw this baby off a cliff because it'll save the economy. Consequentialism, good. You save the economy. Deontology, bad. That's a shitty thing to do. Um, Yes, what if everybody threw babies off? But yeah, then you still wind up running into that. And in virtue ethics, simply 
saying that there's some transcendental system of values that defines good independent of anything else. So and you're good not things are good, a, bad right. things are bad. And you're not going to be afraid to make it anthropocentric or anthrocentric or however you want to say it and say the paradigm of the virtue ethics is the good man. Because if ethics is not anthrocentric, then what the hell is it? it well, it's a part of philosophy that has to be human-centric. Yes. What's the point of ethics that isn't? You can't, and you, you can't impose human ethics on anything other than the human being. The problem is, is that the person making all these deductions and the person uh, philosophizing is a human being and has to follow virtue ethics in the way they theorize. So there is some give and take here, but it's not like you can't believe that because it's wrong. It's more like we think in this way because it is the virtuous way to think because it leads to true beliefs. And it's all integrated into this larger view. But of course you wouldn't care about truth necessarily unless things that are true are good to begin with. Right. Penalty, so calleth itself revenge. With a lying word it faith a good conscience. And because in the willer himself there is suffering, because he cannot will backwards, thus was willing itself and all life claimed to be penalty. So when someone says life is suffering, it's because they have not forgiven their past. And then did cloud after cloud roll over the spirit until at last madness preached. Everything perisheth, therefore everything deserveth to perish. And this itself is justice, the law of time, that he must devour his children. Thus did madness preach. Uh, Nietzsche was aware of Buddhism, by the way. Uh, uh, quite, quite familiar with it, in fact, he, because he learned from Schopenhauer, not directly, but he read Schopenhauer a lot. And Schopenhauer was all about Sanskrit and the, and the uh, Vedic scriptures and the Upanishads and so forth. And, of course, Buddhism came along after that, and Nietzsche was familiar with Buddhism. Morally are things ordered according to justice and penalty. Oh, where is their deliverance from the flux of things and from the existence of penalty? Thus did madness preach. Can there be deliverance when there is eternal justice? Alas, unrollable is the stone it was. Eternal must also be all penalties. Thus did madness preach. No deed can be annihilated. How could it be undone by the penalty? This, this is what is eternal in the existence of penalty. That existence also must be eternally recurring deed and guilt, unless the will should at last deliver itself and willing become non-willing. But ye know, my brethren, this fabulous song of madness. And here, this is actually, it comes across as a shot at Buddhism, willing becoming non-willing, extinguishing all desire. Um, and he is taking something from Buddhist ethics here, like I mentioned, the coal in the hand earlier, and forgiveness. Although I would argue, although I am not a Buddhist, that Nietzsche misunder perhaps misunderstands Buddhism in the same way he misunderstands Christianity. Uh, but that's a can of worms that I'm not going to get into. Away yes, we've from already been going for almost an hour. We've been going for 53 minutes and 31 seconds. Awesome. This is a good stream. And after we end this, guys, we have a little bit more material to cover. After we end this, we're going to be back in between 15 and 30 minutes, stream again, and do the next chapter. Or rather, we're going to do 44. Yeah, oh, right, right. 44. Uh... The stillest hour. Mm -hmm. all, all it was. Oh, go ahead. No, no, by all means, you take a turn. All it was is a fragment, a riddle, a fearful chance until the creating will saith thereto, but thus would I have it. So remember at the very beginning, when. Uh, Zarathustra started talking a bit about how, 
how could I endure to be a man if man were not also the composer and riddle reader and redeemer of chance? So now we go back to this last little bit. And the lucky number and the barrel rider. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, penalty, no deed, will deliver. Ah, here we are. All it was is a fragment, a riddle, a fearful chance, until the creating will saith thereto, but thus would I have it. Until the creating will saith thereto, but thus do I will it, thus shall I will it. But did it ever speak thus? And when does this take place? Hath the will been unharnessed from its own folly? Hath the will become its own deliverer and joy-bringer? Hath it unlearned the spirit of revenge and all teeth-gnashing? And who hath taught it reconciliation with time? And something higher than all reconciliation. Something higher than all reconciliation must the will will, which is the will to power. Ta-da! Surprise, surprise, surprise. It all ends with the will to power. Which is kind of the basis for this imminent transcendental thing that Nietzsche is peddling. Something higher than all reconciliation must the will will, which is the will to power. But how doth that take place? Who hath taught it also to will backwards? But at this point in his discourse, it chanced that Zarathustra suddenly paused and looked like a person in the greatest alarm. With terror in his eyes did he gaze on his disciples, his glances pierced as with arrows their thoughts and a rare thoughts. But after a brief space, he again laughed and said soothedly, It is difficult to live amongst men, because silence is so difficult, especially for a babbler. Thus spake Zarathustra. The hunchback, however, had listened to the conversation and had covered his face during the time. But when he heard Zarathustra laugh, he looked up with curiosity and said slowly, But why doth Zarathustra speak otherwise unto us than unto his disciples? Zarathustra answered, What's there to be wondered at? With hunchbacks, one may well speak in a hunchbacked way. Very good, said the hunchback, and with pupils, one may well tell tales out of school. But why doth Zarathustra speak otherwise unto his pupils than unto himself? And notice that it doesn't end with thus spake Zarathustra. It ends with the words the hunchback. Why does he speak otherwise unto his disciples than unto himself? Well, here, he? He, well, here in these last three chapters of section two, Redemption, Manly Prudence, in the Stillest Hour, you almost get to the crux of the difficulties he has with his philosophy. This idea that somehow the imminent is supposed to produce the transcendent, and ultimately, Zarathustra, i.e. Nietzsche, realizes that this is a huge gamble. This is a huge act of faith he is taking to believe that somehow exercising the will to power produces the Superman. He realizes it. He contends with it, and still he decides to do it. But he doesn't do it on a logical basis. He can't do it on a logical basis, and he realizes that. He realizes that, and still he does it. Right. 
Well, uh, I think that's good enough for now. That's all we have for now. We'll be back in 15 to 30 with chapter 44. And, uh, and we'll see you in a few. Thank you everyone so much for showing up and hitting that like button. It means a lot to me. I, hmm, I love you dearly. That's all we have for now. Until next time.